Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Claudio Murgan, the host of the Spiritual Inspired Podcast, and my uh, guest today is Lukas Wozniak. Lukas graduated this May from New York University's Interactive Telecommunications Program with a thesis focused on augmented reality and mental health, which tells the story of evolution from NeuroHue to UBO, or the speculative design of, the, of a comprehensive mental health care planning, coordination, and management dashboard in cross-platform mixed reality. This year, he also co-founded a research nonprofit called NeuroHue with Ayana Seals. Their first major contract is with CUNY Center for Innovation in Mental Health. Lucas and his colleagues also prototyped two AR versions of the Human Performance Hackathon back in June, where they were awarded most for thinking idea. Lucas, thank you very much for joining me and congrats on so many interesting projects. Thank you, Claudia. Great to be here. Um, so my interest in interviewing you is to find the connection between the technology that is behind your projects, their benefits, long-term potential, and the spiritual side that I try to bring forward when I talk to my guests. So let's start with the program you graduated at uh, NYU and discuss about the NeuroHue and UBO, please. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the program, so yeah, we call it ITP. It's also, yeah, that term interactive telecommunications can be a little complicated. Uh, so they call it the Center for the Recently Possible or Emerging Technology. So you can kind of... Uh, choose your own adventure through dozens of very interesting courses. You can even jump out to other departments if you want, but <clears throat> within the department, there's increasingly these XR or augmented and virtual reality courses. XR is like the comprehensive term for this. could mean extended reality, experiential reality. Um, but that was my general focus, although I tried to branch out into things like artificial intelligence and see how I can apply that to the field and also, definitely a focus on healthcare and mental health therapy applications for the technology. So that's kind of been my uh, recent uh, leap into the professional realm with this NeuroHue nonprofit and some consulting work, um, actually starting to build out real workable solutions, hopefully, with this new technology. And lately, I mean, in the last, at least in the last two years, two and a half years, mental health has declined a lot for, I think, all age brackets, not only for uh, young people, but also for 40 to 60 and even uh, beyond that age. Um, do you find that this uh, statement is, is true? Yes, uh, <clears throat> definitely. Based on my research, I actually prefaced my thesis presentation with some startling facts that were pretty hard to believe for me, but uh, especially the U.S. seems to be pretty poorly performing. Um, there's been like a 33 and increase in suicide rates in the U.S. since like 1999. And um, apparently about 60% of people who potentially have mental health conditions <clears throat> are outside of the actual care system in the U.S. So they're kind of just on their own or, I mean, traditionally people did seek this support from their friends, their community, or, or whatever, maybe spiritualities as well. We can get into that. But um, still, it's uh, pretty disheartening that the system's not reaching people who really could uh, use some help. And also, uh, apparently there's, I mean, uh, <laughs> maybe getting into a debate territory here too, but a lot of evidence-based therapies aren't um, actually the majority of therapies used, which, um, you know, there's this like tension between psychodynamic approaches and something like CBT, which is a modernized approach, but <clears throat> a lot of people in the psychodynamic camp might critique that for being too like mind-based or attempting to control thoughts, whereas it's a more embodied condition or storytelling has more of a role. So um, yeah, there's a lot of dynamics at play here. And also in terms of accessibility, in terms of different demographics, it's also not very great because mental health therapy can be very expensive. But uh, I'm pretty optimistic that technology could help with democratizing access in general. So. Uh -huh. I mean, it's not only my opinion, but overall, the, the pharma industry these days and what the doctors prescribe is just to alleviate the pain. They don't look for the root cause. In mm. your case, will technology look for the root cause of the, the, the issues or the medical uh, challenges? Or again, it's a similar approach of alleviating uh, short-term um, pain? Uh Definitely will depend. So, for example, apparently there's like a 
tens of thousands of mental health apps out on the app stores. And a lot of times there isn't much critical thinking behind them. Maybe they're made by a designer or developer who doesn't consult with researchers or medical professionals or end users with these conditions. Um, so there's a huge uh, range of quality and thoughtfulness behind these interventions. But from my point of view, XR especially is a uh, powerful in terms of you know having a much more informed perspective because for one it can engage the whole person in a, in a way because um, your body is typically involved so it can guide you to feel different parts of your body or engage your, your body in different ways but also there's a lot of data uh, uh, ability to retrieve various data like biometric data eye tracking um, heart rate maybe even brainwave data which has pros and cons as well, because you could try to you know, automate therapy too much, but also this has just never been the case that therapy sessions could have access to all these interesting ways to provide personalized feedback specifically and content to people during a session or as a tool. So, And how do you see <clears throat> the medical practitioners being uh, brought up to date to use these type of applications? Because like in education, you can put together an amazing uh, educational system, but if the teachers are not um, um, up to date and they are not uh, taught to, to apply this methodology, they won't be able to take, or the children or the, the students won't take the full benefit of that system. So how is going to be with, with your approach? Mm. Um, so that's actually something we're innovating on. I think you mentioned our study with CUNY, the City University of New York. Mm. So that goal is actually kind of not focused on the patient, but the provider. So it's training social workers and what they call lay healthcare workers, which has been there. So they actually have a center for innovation in mental health, which isn't about a tech innovation. It's just like a, a different inflection point within the system. So they focus for a couple of decades now on researching um, the training of people like a faith leader in a community or a, could be even a barbershop barber um, with a therapy skill. And they've shown or maybe not drastically, but it can improve mental health outcomes in diverse communities around the world where they've done their research. And um, the idea there is these people interface with, you know, thousands, millions of people um, who might be outside that care system, like I mentioned, part of that 60%. So, um, but they found that through their trainings, it takes a lot of time and people resources, and um, it's like not accessible for a lot of people. So they're curious about translating that into a digital format and offering this simulation training, which might even be more effective in some ways because it uh, can be more on demand and also can be even more engaging now that a where you can pretty um, realistically program human behavior and have someone respond to you with various emotions. Um, this could actually be an effective way of upscaling a huge, you know, increasing workforce. Um, and also there's this book I'd recommend called VRX, which is uh, based out of, or by this guy who's based out of Cedar sinai Hospital in LA. And he had this concept of a virtualist as being a new type of medical practitioner, which would literally be someone in charge with administering the technology and potentially there'd be even like a, a you know, new major within schools for people to become a virtualist. So that could apply to typical physical healthcare or mental healthcare, but. Interesting. Do you see this technology being a, a standalone or being part of, let's say, an environment such as metadata, metaverse, sorry? Mm. Um, I think it could be a range for sure. Uh, like right now, the metaverse is still fairly fragmented and uh, there are people I know actually innovating and creating like metaverse hospitals and they could be something like, for example, within meta, you know, face previously Facebook's Horizon Worlds program they would actually create like a virtual care facility where you can go there and, and have an on-call therapist. Um, so some of it will be very integrated within this increasingly immersive metaverse, but I think some will be very targeted and more like just at a very particular center or for a particular patient, they just get shipped a headset. Um, there's one company called uh, XR Health based in Israel. I think that shifts people headsets all over the world for like, a temporary period and then they could just do the particular intervention and ship it back but yeah and you know just to play the devil's advocate here um we are very creative species and most of the time you know we get in love with our ideas we see them as our babies and 
we want them not just to walk but but run um, and we have historic data that uh, most of the time any technological advancement was uh, you know purchased or taken over by a big corporation or by the government and not used for the benefit of the people so using your you know ethical side <clears throat> Do you see this type of intervention uh, and which can take uh, your technology or similar technologies in a totally different uh, di direction? Mm. Interesting. Um, well, all the big tech companies are very uh, heavily investing in the metaverse right now. So there is a lot of a giant institutional power. The government is increasingly funding these kinds of projects. But uh, at the same time, uh, I did recently just see like, forget who exactly blocked it, I guess, um, FCC or something or, or, or FTC, Federal Trade Commission or something. But um, whoever's in charge of like breaking up monopolies charged Meta or didn't allow Meta to acquire this one company because they thought they were trying to take over the metaverse as one giant trust or monopoly. So that was kind of hopeful, but still, um, you know, Meta already has a huge stronghold since they own and sell the most... Um, popular headset, the Oculus Quest 2, which you actually have to have a Facebook account to access, I believe. And um, they also have ownership of your data, I believe, as well, which a lot of people don't necessarily trust what goes on behind the scenes, where that data is sold, potentially. Um, but there is promise because other companies like Apple, while also being a huge, powerful organization, which isn't necessarily bad, but um, they, you know, really value privacy. So they recently implemented features where you can ask apps not to track your data um, or send it to other companies or apps. So I hope they'll, they're about to release their own AR glasses or VR headset. So I hope that'll be also applied there. And um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's still a lot of room for just independent developers to create their own. Like I mentioned, there's tens of thousands of these mental health apps on the app stores. Google Play, Apple App Store, and those are mostly probably made by smaller teams all around the world. So yeah. hopefully there's a lot of diversity. That'll be, that'll be good. You know, one um, side of research done in uh, mental health and health in general is when someone interacts with nature. You know, you walk barefoot, you splash yourself in a river. So is that touch and feel of, of nature and the synchronization with the earth uh, frequency? Uh, but at the same time, was uh, proven that if you, in your mind, simulate that feeling, you can get the same benefit. So maybe in, in your application, you have that virtual reality, but virtual interaction, in fact, with nature, giving the, the user uh, the same type of approach that he's walking barefoot, that he gets a tingling, let's say which will create the same health benefits as he will walk the, the, the land, the, the grass uh, in, in real life. Because again, that will yeah. be an add-on component and might increase the, the benefits of the, the device, of the technology, and you'll see uh, faster, faster results. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of synergy effects to explore, I guess, um, by combining different senses or haptic feedback or <clears throat> imagination for example like so yeah one study that that reminds me of was because one intervention for menopausal women in the workplace who often experience hot flash symptoms so one study actually showed that just like a hypnosis based suggestion of cold imagery can cool the body temperature so i think there was even one company that showed how snowy environments in VR can also have a similar effect um, of actually literally cooling the physiology. So that was very interesting. Um, although I'd be curious to see if across all the different natural interactions we have, if it's the same effect, or I'd imagine nature is still more powerful in many ways. And some people are, I know, are, are very um, believing that you can never like simulate reality it's way too beautiful or magical or complex and that would be like playing god or something um but you know you could imagine in a couple hundred or a thousand years ai it's probably going to be pretty inconceivably complex so i'm sure you could have some very compelling experiences but uh yeah i think that's 
fascinating because I've heard of like interior design of hospitals having plants or pictures of trees that really improve the patient's health outcomes. So um, that's definitely something we would consider in our own design. But at the same time, that does uh, maybe lead to why I'm more interested in AR or mixed reality than VR, which is the fact that you can still see the real world backdrop. So with these glasses coming out, they're even more seamless than a phone, like a phone kind of holding look through the camera. But uh, with the glasses, you can almost forget they're on your face, but you still see some kind of digital floating anchored content. Meanwhile, you see a whole forest. You could just be in a park and have that awesome backdrop wherever you go. Yeah. Yeah, I really like to see technology comp complementing our lives, not taking over, um, because I think that would be a very sad end result uh, and won't help um, humanity in a long-term um, evolution. I don't think so. Again, that's my opinion. And going back to what you just said, everything comes from our brain because everything is energy. So if we can trick our brain to believe that that's the reality, I think those yeah. benefits, those effects, which you are trying to achieve through your application or similar applications will, will come to fruition. Because again, it's all in our mind. The, the way we know, uh, the better we know to control our minds, the better our lives are and the better we, we create our environment. So it's all about how we think and how we, we, we behave pretty much. Yeah. And uh, getting a bit uh, metaphysical now, um, you graduated and I'm sure that you guys uh, during uh, school talk about, you know, spirituality, divinity, God. Um, is Was that a real discussion? Did your colleagues believe in a higher um, entity, a higher intelligence? Uh, coordinating the, the universe, or it was um, just something they, they're not interested in? Mm. My school? Um, definitely not the institution itself. It's like NYU is um, very global, cosmopolitan, I would say, and there's there's really no talk of it. Um, there's, there's talk of like, I mean, there is like a religious center at school, but you have to seek it out, you know, and then you can maybe join a particular religious society or they do have even mindfulness meditation kind of offerings for people, but in a more secularized way, I would say. Uh, but yeah, like uh, I would say it really is only if like you can find it there, but no one's going to impose that on you. And they will tolerate your own religious views. Like some people might create a project about what spirituality or God means to them. But and like uh, everyone is expected to have like an open temperament um, and be respectful of uh religious conflict there but uh yeah it doesn't come up much i would say in discussions um because just uh probably the the liberal focus at nyu especially where they're not trying to but yeah it would be interesting um because spirituality is kind of universal and maybe there's like a fear of bringing it up for some reason i'm curious why it's not really touched on at all but yeah exactly as you said spirituality is universal <clears throat> and uh, doesn't as is related to faith pretty much has nothing to do with religion so um, that side of us should be encouraged everywhere not only in university but in schools uh, in a day-to-day -day life so yeah without imposing it but at least bring it forward and let people decide what what they want to do um, I don't know if you're aware but in the last couple of years uh, Yuval Noah Harari uh, promoted yeah. every time he had the chance, the idea that humans are uh, hackable animals and useless uh, eaters. He said that we should be controlled through technology on every aspect of our life. Yeah. What's your take on it? I actually did not hear that. I'm almost yeah. surprised he said that, but... Uh... <laughs> Multiple times. At every huh. conference he had the chance, he did that, and he think of pretty much you and me, which are normies, you know, in his mind, <laughs> that we are hackable and, as I said, useless eaters, and we shouldn't have goodwill, God doesn't exist, and we should mm. be controlled by the elites. We should be, if he thinks we should be, right? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. Including himself or? No, he's part of the elite, of course. Oh, he's part of the elite. He's above us. <laughs> 
how, how do you know who's in the elite or not? Does he define that or um, he is, is he the only of, one in the elite? He's or? part of the okay. World Economic Forum and he's a consultant oh, okay. to uh, Carl Schwab. So that's why he's on a podium from where he can uh, spit all these uh, ideas. Fascinating. Um, well, that's a, yeah, that's definitely a debate for me is uh, how much to control, for example, and what that would really mean or look like. Cause I mean, uh, at least with regards to my research, this brings up the idea for me of like diagnosis of mental health conditions and how historically that's been pretty vague and hard to do. But um, like I mentioned, this technology does allow more data points on a person than ever. So you could hopefully get more precise with diagnosing someone and then auto automating like the recommendation of a treatment. But I'm not sure if there's a way to perfect that to like guarantee like every time there is there should be no choice involved for the person because it's like you should just do yoga in this forest instead of taking this medication and doing some journaling or something like <laughs> I feel like it's just such a creative process I would say that's very unique to different people you can definitely automate or recommend a lot of it and try to control a lot of it but uh similar to um I mean like there's just inherent spontaneity in things um, I mean at least based on what we know in science and quantum physics now like how you can't exactly predict location of electrons or um like this whole like wave particle duality I mean it's <laughs> That's a, I'm not sure if there's new theories kind of challenging that or thinking we can like eventually predict these things and then therefore control the whole universe in a perfect way. But um, I wouldn't totally be against it, maybe. Um, but I do personally value like discovery and imperfection and, and how like maybe you do make a mistake or delay the perfect care. I mean, hopefully you have pretty good advice, but maybe we shouldn't try to just make everything too controlled. But Yes. Yeah. I mean, he he was thinking way beyond um, health. <clears throat> he was, you know, going much, much um, deeper. But, you know, time will tell if uh, they will succeed uh, or not. Now, about your personal choices, do you have a, a spiritual guru or someone who you look up to? Mm, not a guru, actually. Uh, I wasn't raised with any religion so even though my grandparents were Roman Catholic on one side at least and my parents had initially been raised Christian but they both kind of abandoned the church I would say because of they sent some kind of dogma or like a lot of hypocrisies or like didn't want to be beaten with a ruler or something in primary school so they kind of went on their own but they didn't necessarily fill in that gap of spirituality because like they said uh this is universal. So we need some, like, there's still questions about why are we here? Like you could just kind of ignore them, but I feel like there's just this gap there. So, but I was sort of raised in that gap and kind of just given freedom on my own to speculate and wasn't even that familiar with things like the Bible or had read much. So I didn't even have much of a support or context, but I do think I naturally started questioning these things. And since I was uh, raised a lot with within nature, I would say, like in Pennsylvania, going to a lot of parks, camping trips, exploring in the woods with friends, or times I was kind of led to speculate and I would say form a pretty mystical connection with nature and believe in this like mysterious kind of um, deeper intelligence somehow related to nature that I could kind of trust as a guide and uh, felt like I could go to typically more natural environments to get back in contact with that intuition um, over time, I'm having more questions than ever, probably. So I don't even know if I would just say it's nature anymore that I trust. Um, it's, but I do think there's some very interesting, deeper, intelligent kind of um, principles that haven't really been scientifically observed yet or able to be put into human rational understanding of how things work. Because, I mean, especially just in the last year, I'm really amazed at how things just seem to align, like, I just go to this place, meet this person who happens to be exactly who I'm kind of looking for, whether it's like a collaborator for a project or, I don't know, funder or just a very fascinating person. I'm like, how did this even happen? This is like too magical or something, you know? So <laughs> I'm very magical. curious. If you yeah. put the intention out there, it's becoming magical. 
And uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't, but we all have uh, spiritual guides. So all we have to do, and I, I talk about this very often with my guests, all we, all we have to do is to ask for help and they will guide us or they will bring mm -hmm. us um, the right person or the right event, the right moment in our life to fulfill our path. So as long as we step aside from our ego, or we ask our ego to step aside, in fact, uh, and ask these questions honestly with an open heart um, and ask for help, in fact, these instances will keep coming our way and we will get what we want. So I'm glad that you have this uh, conscious understanding that good things happen to you and it's magical, which is a very um, good word for characterizing these type of uh, encounters. So please keep this magic uh, coming your way <laughs> by putting out uh, good intentions. Yes, for sure. <laughs> and also teach your or talk to your friends about what's coming towards you because we can influence our environment. We can change one person at a time. And mm. by you telling them to take the same approach as you are taking, um, they might try it. You never know. Mm. And that ripple effect will, will go forward and much farther uh, out. It's actually, yeah, it's uh, interesting you say that because there was one word or phrase I had for this called the back door approach, but it's like, or some people say that the path less traveled, but there's just so many interesting, unusual ways like things do line up or to get involved with something that isn't the immediate. For example, finding a job is a great example, which I think is a very practical application of this, but it's not as simple as just applying on LinkedIn. I mean, that's the modern way, but there's a lot of disadvantages to that. For example, like the fact that it might just be an AI who weeds people out if they don't have a certain yeah. word yeah. in their resume or something. So like a you know, going out there, like I heard of people who just hang out. I mean, some of it's still logically planned. Like you can go to financial district and maybe run into some belt banker who doesn't know what to do with some extra funds he has. And then like, oh, now I found my first. Name. But uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of mystery to explore and to embrace, I think. So happy to share that. <laughs> Have you tried any retreats in uh, South America, either plant medicine or... Um dark room retreats, anything of that kind. <laughs> also very fascinating you mentioned that since I haven't yet, but I'm planning to this September, literally in one month, I have a plan. Um, and if anyone on the podcast is listening is interested, well, I'm actually kind of recruiting for the trip, which is uh, actually from an alum of my grad program, ITP named Isa Paez, who when she graduated, she went back to Ecuador where she's from and actually shadowed a shaman or a yachak they call them down there. His name was Alberto Taxi. We were actually writing a piece for a journal and then he passed away and passed on his legacy to her. So she's doing her first pilot retreat and um, kind of first time really stepping into like more of a and a leadership approach to her spiritual practice, which I would say is a mix of the ancient teachings she, uh, she got from him, but also she's been applying more modern lenses for sure and trying to make it as non-dogmatic as possible. So really appreciate that. And I feel like it's a hidden gem opportunity, but it will include some plant medicine and just amazing nature experiences, some like specially designed rituals, like something called the water dance, where you only dance for eight hours after drinking something called Agua Coya, when there's a local band that plays the whole time that had designed music just for this event. So very excited for that. How about yourself? <laughs> um... I was planning to go there in 2019 and uh, things uh, went south and <clears throat> I couldn't. Everything went, um, I mean, we had to postpone it and we couldn't go since. In fact, it was 2020, sorry, 2020. And um, no, I haven't had the chance to do anything in South America, only in North America. But uh, anyway, it's an interesting experience. I, I recommend to anyone who has the chance to um, to do it at a personal level, because it's all, again, personal. We have our own journeys and we, we learn and we find out more about who we are as we walk this, uh, this path. So, um, yes, I, I wish you luck and uh, I'm sure you're going to have a wonderful experience there. Thank you. Yeah, I think at this stage, since I just graduated, I'm about a quarter of my life, it's a good time to uh, have this experience. So. Yes. 
any other um, things to share with us about the, the programs? How are we going to envision to take them uh, farther to uh, a much more practical uh, approach? You mean uh, in terms of XR technologies? Or... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, share it, I guess. So I would just, yeah, for anyone interested, I'd recommend, honestly, just like searching AR, VR for whatever condition or application um, on like Google Scholar or something, because most people would be surprised, I think, to find that there's thousands of studies that have already been completed. Some of them are fairly high quality or large scale, and there's been very promising results for a range of conditions, like especially PTSD is a big one. Um, things like anxiety or depression are a little harder, but I think there's a lot of uh, hopeful innovation coming out. For example, there's something called a, I don't know how they say the acronym, but JIT. AI, a just-in-time adaptive intervention, but it's the idea of, for example, maybe you have a headphones, which also have a microphone, so or some other kinds of sensors connected to it, so it can detect based on a particular individual's tendency to have a panic attack in a certain place, um, and predict like, oh, they're maybe going to start having this sort of emotional reaction that will feel very painful and out of control to them, so we can start layering in some audio, whether it's just kind of healing sounds or their own self-talk, helping them reframe the situation. Uh, but I think more and more of these more complex kind of indefinable conditions like depression, which, or anxiety, which, you know, like you can do stuff in the therapy office, but more and more this technology lets you take that into the real moments outside of the therapy office that are the hardest to reach. So there's a lot of exciting promise, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Lucas, we're approaching the end of the, the interview. Any final thoughts? Um, no, I'm very excited to, or, to check the other guests on the podcast, curious about their probably pretty different <laughs> approach to spirituality. Um, and thank you so much. This is an awesome first podcast opportunity. So thank you. Uh, and for my viewers, thank you for watching. Uh, please share it. Um, get a free copy of my book when uh, you visit uh, my uh, website. And until next time, love and gratitude.